Done. Yeah, there you go. Now the recording started and uh, um, there is also this, this form where you can, okay. Yeah, well, yes, you, you sorry, uh, exactly, Giovanni. Procedure. I'm Rita, please. I'm preparing yes, my so I just now. wanted to, uh, to say that uh, we don't know who, uh, we, that who the participants of this session are. So kindly, I will put this link on the chat and I request that uh, if you would like to stay in touch with us and also if you, if you fill in the form to, to, in, to let us know who, who attended the session, that would be great. I will put this link all in the chat. So please use it. And uh, yes, to raise your questions, please use the chat and uh, we will we will uh, speak with the panelists. We will inform the panelists. Um, and uh, yeah, from Hub for Cloud, uh, I mean, Giovanni will uh, will present anyway. This is, uh, these are our partners. And Giovanni, please, yes, go ahead. Yeah, so I will uh, now share my screen for the presentation on, on Hub for Cloud. So share. Okay, can you see the cover slide? Not yet. Not yes, yet. now we can. Yeah. Okay, very good. So as I said before, uh, my name is Giovanni Rimassa from Martel Innovate and I am the project coordinator of the Hub for Cloud project that I can now quickly present to you. It is uh, not a research project, but is a coordination and support action, which means that we take care of uh, helping the research and innovation project in a certain area to work together, to exchange information, to be aligned on the, uh, let's say, European Commission policies, uh, or to have uh, um, to share resources and to share communication channels and so on. In particular, um, for cloud is a part of uh, um, program of, of, of initiative of the European Commission that includes also other projects that is called Horizon Cloud. The goal, of course, is to have a single point of coordination and, uh, and communication for uh, all the research and innovation projects that are at the moment active as part of Horizon 2020 still uh, in the area of uh, cloud computing and, uh, let's say, uh, similar and, and, and connected topics like artificial intelligence on big data or, uh, or edge computing and so on. So we are routinely engaged with a number of these, uh, these uh, projects that we help and we learn from their, from their advancements. In particular, uh, our mission is to have a, a unified uh, communication and engagement strategy with all the projects. There is a, a communication task force where we come together with the other coordination projects and the research project in the area. So there is a, co a continuous, let's say, exchange of information and participation also to events like this is part of this, of this uh, initiative. And we started uh, this year and we will, the project will last for, for one and a half years. So the idea here, there are several different objectives. One is what I just said, that we have to help projects work together among themselves, but also with the important initiatives that, that are there in cloud computing or, or end users and so on. So on the one hand, we try to give technological, that we give exposure to technological advance that, that the projects, the research project work on. And on the other hand, we help them interact with each other and with uh, the, um, with the general uh, external uh, European cloud computing uh, um, landscape. We also do uh, strategic road mapping activities because of course it helps to gather opinions and to drive, uh, uh, to drive the, the process of understanding what's going on in the, in the field. We do, of course, engagement, uh, we manage uh, communication for, for the projects and for the commission on the topic. And uh, in particular, um, Up for Cloud is the second uh, coordination action that works a part for, of the Horizon Cloud program because the first one is called H Cloud, started uh, two, years, uh, two years ago. And uh, at the moment, the two projects work together in the same, with the same website, with the same channels, and um, Up for Cloud will then take over from H Cloud when, when this ends. 
In particular, since uh, for cloud started afterwards, uh, it has uh, a complementarity view, and we have uh, specific topics that were not covered by the by the first project, and uh, we are instead uh, complementing like that. For example, edge computing and cloud federation were in the agenda of each cloud; they still are, and we instead have uh, different uh, um, topics like uh, addressing the skill gap in cloud computing or uh, um, or uh, helping entrepreneurs to transfer the technological innovation uh, in cloud to uh, viable and, and sustainable market strategies. And uh, this is the consortium that I'm already said. Uh, we are uh, Martel, uh, a Swiss company, uh, consulting, and then the results from Spain, Technalia, and their associated partner, Technalia Ventures, is also a research. Um, uh, Applied Research uh, Institute from, from Spain, Technalia, and the Ventures is their incubator and, and business, uh, uh, business advice uh, entity. So without uh, boring you too much with the structure of the project, there are different uh, organization of work that, that, that try to, to achieve the objective that I, that I mentioned before. And what is important for the purpose of this talk of, the, of today is that among our, this boost is basically the, the thematic uh, um, exploration and, and, uh, and uh, engagement of people that we have, as I said, in, in topics that are complementary of, uh, of, uh, the, the first, uh, of the first project of the program. And one of these, as you can see, is exactly this pre-standardization, open source and standardization. So I can quickly now finish uh, zooming in on this, on, this, on this task, on this part of the project, because uh, this uh, gives us the, the good starting point for, for the panel after, after my, my introduction. So of course, we are a coordination and support action. So we are at the service in a certain sense of the commission policies on one hand and the research projects uh, on the other hand. So we try to help the, the project in European cloud computing by um, analyzing what are their planned strategies to contribute or to produce open source uh, software, and likewise to uh, use, leverage, or contribute to standardization or pre-standardization efforts. We also try to identify good practices because in this, uh, in this position of, of a coordination project, you interact with uh, in, the, in our case is 12 uh, research projects and you can see what they do similarly, what they do differently and you can uh, help them talk to each other and uh, find out what are the best practices that they should adopt. For example, when uh, interacting with an open source community or with uh, uh, trying to see if there is a, a way forward towards standardizing some of the project results. So far, what we have done is that we have uh, analyzed open source initiatives in the cloud area and some st standards in the cloud area, and we have completed a first overview of these uh, initiatives, and this is already available on the uh, portal, on the website of the program that includes our projects and the others associated, that you can then go and, and directly browse there. I imagine that Amrita will have posted in the chat the information for the website so that you can go and, and, uh, and uh, download the, the, the deliverable and other things uh, like the other topics that I mentioned before, like the, the skill gap analysis, these are also, are also available there. And uh, last, we also uh, engage directly the project because beyond the general landscape, it's important to know what these projects are doing, what is their opinion about standard, standard do they have uh, uh, tasks, do they want to produce standard or to analyze them, so is it in their project agenda to do so or not, and the same for open source. So in this uh, same deliverable, uh, we also uh, gather the statistics of the consultation process where you can see, for example, uh, how important uh, open source policies are considered to be by the various projects or which uh, uh, open source uh, contributions they have planned or which standardization working group they want to interact with and so on. So this is all for the initial um, 
uh, introduction. I hope this uh, put a little bit uh, the today the, the today's panel in the context of uh, our project and the general uh, European cloud computing work. And now, um, Amrita, if you can get the screen back, I think you can share again the, the panel slide because I think we would start uh, with that unless there are already uh, questions or something from the from the public. So this is the web page where you can download where you can download the, the various deliverables. Okay, so if there is nothing if there is nothing on the on the chat, Amrita, I would just go on with the with the panel. Exactly. Sorry, I was not able to un yeah. unmute. There was there was no question. Yeah, okay, okay. But yeah, but if you don't show the panel slide, okay. Otherwise, I, I can share again. I don't know how you want to do it, but okay. So we start now the the panel on the um, importance and let's say and, and relevance of um, of the open source standardization for the future of uh, of cloud computing. And the idea here is to tackle the possible um, uh, challenges and and uh, roadblocks and opportunities from a series of different aspects. And that's why we have our uh, illustrious panelists that can represent different different aspects of the of the on, 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 on different perspectives on, with which you, you can look you can look at the problem. So first, as you can see in the slides, we have uh, Brian King from Eclipse Foundation, and Brian is a cloud development tools uh, community manager there. Then we have uh, Alberto Marti, the VP uh, for community relations with open source in Open Nebula. Then we have Dr. Uh, Bear, Andre Bear, uh, that he's from Sintef in Norway, is a chief scientist soft for, soft for the division of software and service innovation. And last but not least, we have Luca Bolognini from the uh, Italian Privacy Institute, uh, and he's uh, uh, legal uh, ICT legal uh, consulting, and he's president of the of the Institute Italiano Privacy. Um, if the panelists uh, agree, I would like uh, to welcome them, of course, but I would like to uh, open uh, the session with a general question that gives you a little bit also the opportunity to introduce yourself and uh, let's say state your, your angle of, uh, of view on the, on, the, on the topic. So I would like to start with a, with, with a round in the order in the order of the slides. So starting from uh, Brian King, and uh, the idea is, uh, you know, the, we are in this in this session, but the whole uh, the whole conference is about uh, shaping the digital future uh, beyond uh, beyond what we have now in, in cloud computing. And so I would like to know uh, what is, uh, from your perspective, from your specific uh, let's say angle, what is the um, there's some significant development that you see in European cloud computing in general, and what is the role that you see is particularly significant for open source and or standardization. Now, I don't want to second guess which you, you're going to cover, so please, uh, the floor is yours, Brian. Yeah, thank you very much, Giovanni. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Fantastic. Yeah, so... Um, as it was said, uh, I work for the Eclipse Foundation. We are now a, um, a European registered foundation, um, an open source foundation, and we handle everything, everything in the open source lifecycle from, um, you know, IP policy of, of your code uh, to governance, you know, we ensure vendor neutral governance all the way through to, you know, hosting of the source code, running of the projects and so on. Um, so we've been working at this for 20 years. Um, we're very excited to see what's happening in cloud, particularly in Europe. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, recently we became a, a European registered organization. So for me, um, one upcoming development I'm, I'm uh, excited about, of course, is digital autonomy and cloud autonomy and, you know, um, you know, in, in the Gaia X and the H Cloud ecosystem, there's there's a lot of talk about that, of course, and, and what it means and how do we get there? How does Europe get there? I think 
OSS kind of leads the way. I think it provides a kind of a, a, a one pathway to look at this because, you know, obviously in open source, uh, everything can be used without restrictions. So I think if we build uh, all the other frameworks, not, not just the code, but all the other frameworks um, around digital autonomy with that in mind, you know, how, how can things be used without restrictions? How can anybody plug into them? Well, then I think uh, we'll be on the right path. Um, you know, I come from a tools background and at Eclipse, I'm working in, in our cloud dev tools working group. You know, we're, we're traditionally known for our IDE, but we're working on a next generation uh, tools uh, in and for the cloud. Um, and from a technology standpoint, one development uh, I'm excited about is AI and machine learning. Um, and that's going to, it's going to enable more automation greater scaling um, and enable a lot more innovation in the cloud space. So, so that's definitely one thing I'm excited about. I think there's lots of good open source AI projects out there like TensorFlow, like ClearML, OpenNN, et cetera, but they're, they're, not, they're not necessarily organized more at a holistic level. You know, what, what, are, what is the open source slash standardization strategy around AI and particularly in Europe, you know, there's a lot of talk about ethics, but not necessarily about, you know, technical implementations. And I could be wrong, like maybe some of you here today, uh, some of the panelists had, have heard of some um, um, initiatives around open AI in, in Europe in particular. So I'd love to hear about them. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. And, uh... Uh, I would go on unless there are again you and Rita tell me if there are immediate questions ever for the panelists. Otherwise, I, I uh, proceed with uh, Alberto. Uh, that's the same, uh, let's say, setup, but of course, different angle because uh, you are involved in open source relation, but you're also uh, a, a cloud provider, an edge provider as well. So, floor is your uh, Alberto. Great. Thank you. Let's see if uh, this works. Yeah. I can see you. Well, uh, yeah. First of all, yeah, thank, thanks a lot for the uh, for the invitation to, to participate in this in this panel. Um, I'll, I hope I'll be able to to answer all the questions. Um, hopefully, we won't get into many, very very technical stuff. Otherwise, I'll have to ask for reinforcements. But uh, I mean, in the general general terms, I think um, also uh, congratulations and, and a big thank you to the work you are doing uh, from the Hub for Cloud project as well to help the industry in Europe and beyond map and identify relevant uh, relevant standards and initiatives in this field. Um, I think from our perspective as a as an open as an open source cloud and edge uh, platform as a, as a technology provider um, standards uh, and the, the connection with open source as we implement the, the product and, uh, and develop the project is they are a big opportunity for us, but they're also a challenge in, in the way in which we, we develop um, a, a long-term sustainability strategy for the project uh, while trying to, to support these standards and implement these standards. Um, but I mean, we can, we can talk about that a bit later on in this, this uh, kind of, this, um, not, I wouldn't say a conflict, but a tension between the um, kind of um, uh, de facto standards in the market and uh, and the, uh, the formal standards and how how we try to to uh, support the standards but also have to adapt to the to the industry and the market and environment. But yeah, I mean, in, in general terms, um, again, thank you for for your for your efforts to as an industry and a, a representative and a, and a technology provider to also to help us identify relevant standards and initiatives for us. So yeah, looking forward to, to the debate today. Thank you very much, Alberto. Then uh, I would move uh, to uh, Arne uh, for the, I would say, probably more uh, research uh, perspective, but uh, please uh, go ahead. Yes, <coughs> thank you very much, Giovanni. Um, yes, so I'm from uh, Research Institute, Sintef in Norway, which is a similar to Fraunhofer or uh, other large uh, national institutes. Um, I'm from a digital division there, so uh, research is the foundation. But uh, obviously, relating to infrastructures, um, my 
background and focus is actually more on combining all of the technologies um, together in what I think uh, currently is called the computing continuum or the trans continuum or the cognitive continuum uh, because I have active roles in organizations like BDVA, the Big Data Value Association, IoT on IoT and CLEAR on AI and also to the corresponding uh, standard organization uh, with ISO SE42 for AI and big data, ISO SE41 on uh, IoT and digital twin, and uh, uh, also applications uh, with ISO TC211 on uh, G GIS, where we do have good experiences from the combination of standards uh, and uh, open source typically using open source for the implementation of the interface part of standards uh, to ensure interoperability and, and make it easier for various organizations to relate to the standards by providing smart standards, we can say in these days, not only paper, but actually executable standards through open source. Uh, so I see a lot of opportunities here and I do see the cloud actually as the binding glue for all of these different uh, say boundaries I talked about uh, from say IoT on one side uh, to uh, AI and also to, to HPC. We also have projects with the Euro HPC context, which all fits into the context of I think uh, the topics of the, the conference this week. So uh, I don't see any conflict at all. I see quite the opposite, uh, a high degree of synergy uh, with, uh, uh, at least in some situations, combining open source implementations of standards or promoting standards through open source implementations. Obviously, sometimes uh, open source uh, works as it is and, and are to some extent uh, bypassing the need to have a standard used open source and then why have a standard because use that only open source. So there are of course situations of that also that are, are interesting to discuss. Um, so there are different uh, combinations here. Uh, there was also uh, I think a question when we do research and do new things that are not yet maybe in a, in a phase to be standardized are there conflicts here. But I think uh, these can uh, in, in our no modern more accessible world also dynamic standards uh, be, be quite easily handled because I view all of this as a kind of commu community effort, even the standards are to some extent, I think that. Uh, so uh, as we can discuss further, I think this can go very well hand in hand. Thank you very much. Quite a few uh, are already in discussion points that we have to still uh, consider and I already saw that there are some some difference uh, in in uh, in uh, in opinion or at least at different angles as we were hoping for. But first, uh, I finished the initial round with uh, Luca Bolognini. Please, Luca, go ahead for, uh, I suppose, uh, more of a legal, normative, or uh, I don't know, did I say ethical or not, but <laughs> that side of, of, uh, of the problem, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this invitation. Yes, my uh, perspective is the lawyer's perspective, the lawyer's angle. I'm both a business data lawyer, so one at, and, and, but I am also the president of the Italian Institute for Privacy, that is the main Italian think tank dedicated uh, since more than 10 years, 13 years uh, this year, uh, to, to data protection, of course, ethics, uh, privacy, and other aspects, legal aspects of uh, new technology. And I, I must say that, yes, I, I, I look at these changes, these evolution uh, in a light that is always uh, worried for complication and complexity in terms of uh, legal impacts. And when it comes to standards, standardization, of course, I, I think about legal standards, I think about contractual standards, and I think about the uh, difficulties uh, many times, uh, every time something moves on and we move towards uh, new, uh, new models, uh, new business models, uh, and open source uh, uh, pieces uh, in, uh, in uh, such fields like uh, cloud computing, cloud plus edge, uh, this is the trend, of course. 
Yes, when it, when it comes to uh, contractual standards, uh, I think that uh, the first uh, need I feel as a lawyer is a need for uh, clarification, for certainty of uh, scenarios that are more and more uh, innovative and, and, and complex. So, uh, uh, legal standards, uh, uh, contractual standards uh, uh, mean something uh, clarifying what tools, what, what legal tools to be used uh, in what scenarios, what specific scenarios, not only in terms of data protection of cybersecurity, but also in terms of intellectual property, for instance, or uh, or uh, uh, in order to protect uh, market freedom and to balance freedom uh, in the market uh, between operators, between uh, operators and users and users, consumers, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are several examples that I, I can make, I can share with you, uh, and I will uh, during this meeting. Uh, but again, my focus is there. Uh, just to try to understand, to figure out uh, possible certain uh, legal solutions in order to, uh, to, to, to make new models possible uh, and lawful, hopefully. Thank you, and thanks everyone for this uh, already very stimulating first round of, uh, of uh, interventions. Uh, and uh, now I'm trying to pick uh, some 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 threads uh, among uh, among what you what you mentioned. And certainly, uh, one point is uh, uh, already partly 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 covered. Is I mean we have two topics here, right? Open source and standardization. Why did we put them together? Are they friends? Are they are they opponents? Uh, or are they strange uh, you know, travel companions that yeah, often are there, but they are not really caring too much about each other. So um, let's say in the, in, the, in the short introduction, we heard that uh, uh, Alberto pointed out that sometimes there is conflict, whereas uh, uh, Arne said more that uh, they are usually you know, work together, uh, but of course this is all uh, these are all um, partial views of the of the of the topic. So I would like to understand um, from from each of you. Let's say where or how you see standards and open source working together, and uh, where are on the other hand uh, the situations uh, where uh, you see that there must be a there might be a structural conflict or anyway some di some intrinsic divergence of interest between these two these two approaches of uh, sharing let's say sharing uh, and agreeing on technological ways of solving problems right so this is the basic. Uh, the basic um, commonality between between open source and, uh, and and standards. So maybe we can start with Alberto now. We rotate okay. like yeah, this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll try to explain that kind of. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, by conflict, it's not really a conflict. It's more like an internal um, debate we have to mm -hmm. come back from time to time. And, uh, and I guess it's also a an internal contradiction. I guess from the that comes from the um, from the open source um, business uh, model, and and that implies that because it's an it's an open source model, but it's a it's a business model as well. So, the problem that we've had with um, with the standards sometimes is the lack of of demand from from our user base and our customers. So we are an open source technology. We we adhere to to um, as many standards as we as we can, but then in developing the product and in producing implementations of some of these standards we also have to follow the demand the real demand from our customers and users in that process is where we've seen this divergence of, of interest so we strategically believe in in, in in the need to to use our technology and we've used we've used that uh, sometimes and as part of also of some projects as well European projects to, to implement some standards and then first implementations and so on. But then um, we've come across the sometimes the lack of, of, of demand from, from our users. And instead, what they ask for is the implementation or the integration with other technologies that are more like de facto or, or have become de facto um, standards. And in that sense, I mean, uh, things like 
but like Terraform, for, like Terraform, for instance, for us is a, is, a, is a must, and that's the way we we implement our our own uh, um, interoperability layer on top of, of the of the um, different cloud providers we we integrate in our multi cloud. Um, Technology, so um, that's that's one of the that's one of the, technology, the technologies, for instance, that we identified and we recognize in our users as as a, as a real demand. On the other hand, for instance, I mean, as part of our uh, connection as, as day one members of, of DiaX, for instance, we follow all the conversations about the the implementation of the uh, the, the federated services and the, the the possible use of some some standards as well to connect different providers, things like um, Oasis Tosca. Um, I mean, for, for us, it's it's an, it's an interesting. It will be an interesting challenge, and it will be a, a, an addition to our technology. But in, in, in the reality is that we've never come across any user or customer demanding this for a for a, for a production environment. So that's that's the kind of conflict I, I was referring to. It's not a kind of a philosophical um, conflict. It's more like a practical conflict derived from the open source business model we we implement. That was uh, that. That was the uh, that kind of tension I was yeah, referring clear, to. Clear, very clear, and uh, absolutely understandable from the point of view of of an open source provider that is just uh, providing. I mean, so of course you have you have your uh, your uh, expectation reality checked with uh, with uh, with the demands and the, the request from from your uh, from your clients and your users. Mm -hmm. So then I, I would then go on uh, with uh, with Arne that you took it the other side, but you also mentioned at some point that uh, sometimes uh, the, the two things, they don't go hand in hand. So how can we improve as well? This is, that's an also another interesting point. Yes, no, I think, I mean, if you take just Eclipse as an example, which is an environment we have been using uh, for, for many years, uh, this has worked well with its various uh, developments activities without uh, being standardized. So it's an example on an open source without a standard for it. Uh, and maybe because it's an environment that is, is growing where there is no so much need for interoperability. Uh, perhaps um, it's, it's developed by new say, add-on projects that provide new functionality on, on this core. Uh, while in other areas uh, where, where I've been working with the GIS domain, there is a lot of need for, for interoperability of data, also interoperability of, of services. And I think we have had a quite a successful development there on, on uh, uh, services and service-oriented architectures for GIS uh, uh, with the Open Geodata Consortium and uh, with a link to FOSS on free open uh, software on, on GIS uh, for open source and then with ISO TC211 for standards. Uh, so you have uh, both open source, uh, say, industrial standards like OGC and uh, uh, the dual standards like ISO TC211. And, and this works quite well. Um, we have now the standards with open source implementations, often used as a starting point for commercial implementations of the same standards with, say, higher performance or other quality aspects uh, that uh, kind of gives a reasoning why you might buy and pay for the software, uh, but uh, standard ensure interoperability among multiple products. So uh, I think uh, uh, both cases can be made. Um, uh, open source doesn't always require standards, but I would actually say that uh, standards, uh, at least when you look at IT standards, would actually benefit from more open source implementations than we have seen so far. I think, unfortunately, ISO is still uh, in the stage that they are planning to live by selling standards as mm -hmm. documents. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are moving towards smart standards, which will be executable standards, uh, um, which obviously can be implemented in software, which will have aspects of open source to it, I think. Uh, so um, I think in the future, open source implementation of standards, at least the standard interfaces necessary for interoperability, it would be a, a good strategy. And we have examples of this working. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, maybe uh, Luca, I was wondering, do you feel that uh, open source implementation give you more legal certainty that do they help? Because as an engineer, I see, well, it, it, it runs, right? It's like, uh, it's precise more than the standard, but maybe from a legal point of view, it's not obvious that it is, uh, that it helps. 
I'm quite neutral uh, for this. I, I think that, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we should search for uh, possible solutions in terms of uh, uh, compliance uh, uh, with regulations, uh, lawfulness of the activities that are carried out. Um, and so, if we apply this criteria to the open source uh, and open source, open source standards uh, in, in the cloud sector, I think that uh, uh, we should consider what we already have in terms of legal, juridical tools. And I could start from the uh, fr fr from uh, from the GDPR, uh, so famous, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so so we can understand each other. Uh, if you read the GDPR, you can find uh, some aspects that are very flexible and that are general principles uh, that can be applied, that can fit also uh, a, a cloud computing scenarios and of course uh, uh, open source. Uh, in these scenarios. But uh, you can find reading the GDPR also, and I use the GDPR as an example, just because it is significant. Uh, you can find also a, a significant, uh, relevant, uh, uh, in my opinion, rigidity. It is rigid for some aspects. Uh, for instance, the relationship between uh, subjects, active subjects uh, of processing activities. So uh, who is the controller, who is the uh, processor and the sub-processor uh, of, of personal data. Uh, the GDPR for these roles uh, uh, provides uh, uh, strict rules. And the same happens uh, in case of international data transfers. If you want to transfer to export personal data outside the European Union. Okay. These two uh, examples, these two cases, uh, bring us uh, in front of a, a, a perfect practice of, uh, uh, not perfect, but a good practice of standardization, of legal uh, standardization, that is the uh, standardization of clauses. You know that uh, the European Commission, according to the GDPR, uh, can, and uh, uh, actually, uh, the European Commission approved and issued uh, in June 2021 uh, the new versions uh, can approve uh, standard clauses. The European Commission uh, in June this year approved both standard clauses to be used in order to export data outside the EU. Okay, this is this concerns the international data transfers. And another set of clauses that is a standard clause just in order to, uh, to appoint data processors, uh, to bind data processors uh, uh, to the instructions and directions of data controllers. Why am I mentioning these um, tools? Just because uh, I think that we need a step more. We think we need something more coming from the institutions, from the European Commission in this case, for this example, but it could happen also in other ways. We should identify standard clauses, standard contractual clauses for specific models, specific scenarios. Just because I could have, due to the particular technology that is used, uh, due to the uh, uh, kinds of players and of uh, uh, technology, open source, not open source, a mix of the two uh, that is being used, uh, we could have significant differences among scenarios that are not addressed enough according to the current standard clauses. So to make it simple, for the example that I, 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 made, uh, uh, I made now, I would expect for specific but standard scenarios of cloud computing, cloud and edge computing, for specific deployments, think about smart cities, smart services, the specific uh, uh, activities in the research field, I would expect for more specific standardization of clauses, of contractual clauses, identifying and clarifying 
with certainty what roles, what measures, technical, organizational, contractual, have to be uh, to, 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 to be put in place uh, for those specific scenarios. It is a, a challenge. It is something very, very, uh, very, very uh, um, uh, challenging because it, it brings uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the expert to analyze the details of specific scenarios, but there is room to standardize. Uh, not uh, at a level that is now too high. That mm. are standard clauses in order to export data or to or, or to contract uh, with a data processor or the chain of the sub data processors. These are only examples, but just to uh, to communicate uh, mm. my message: standardization of legal tools means to I, it, it, it implies the, the the necessity to identify scenarios, sub scenarios, and to find the solution, common solution for those scenarios. Thanks. Uh, so if, if I understand right, these standard clauses, this is ready-made uh, uh, contract text that can be used as is, right? So in this case, that standard clause is both the IT standard that tells you in paper what the software uh, must do, and also the implementation, right? In, so in, in your case, uh, it, it collapses into one artifact. Yes, more, more. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is more relevant for the legal uh, mm -hmm. relationship uh, because the uh, technological aspects uh, can be detailed and uh, customized, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. out the But uh, yes, again, uh, uh, law and regulations are about uh, the relationships between human beings, between individuals, between individuals and technology. And so they take the picture of something that uh, represents uh, a model, a dynamic. And so we, we, we should take those pictures and try to fix, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to freeze somehow uh, the scenarios, uh, giving certainty. Think about, and, and I'm closing, but think about the uh, new models of uh, crowdsourced cloud, open source. Uh, cloud distributed uh, that is a, a tail of the gig economy if you want uh, so the, the possibility to to use uh, the, the uh, resources and the uh, servers in our homes in order to to contribute to a network of, uh, of, of uh, and to become a, a distributed and crowdsourced data center and simplifying but this this is a, a new, a completely new scenario that is now not addressable with the contractual tools that we have, even with the contract, standard contractual clauses that the European Commission uh, issued in terms of personal data protection. What about these uh, dynamics and these scenarios? So we should identify them and then try to find a common standard. Thank you. Uh, so now, Brian, uh, is uh, your last this round. Uh, I wanted to also uh, make a short comment on something that uh, uh, Arne said about Eclipse, the ID, right? It's, uh, he said it doesn't need standard because it doesn't need interoperability. But then I was thinking of the plugin architecture of Eclipse. So there is also this, this attempt uh, in, uh, in uh, to, to create a composable, um, extensible thing. So this is also, I think, another aspect that is maybe interesting comparing standards and, and uh, open source uh, concrete implementation that sometimes are not purely concrete, you know, because they are extensible. Oh uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with Arne in, in terms of, you know, not, op not all open source needs to be standardized. Uh, but, you know, I can see the other side where, where Luke is coming from, where um, there's certain things that it's absolutely essential that they're standardized, right? So, so um, <clears throat> you know, I think, I think open, open source in general moves faster uh, than standardization. Um, so it, it, it's very hard for standards to keep up. Um, I, I think we have the top-down and the bottom-up models, which, which have been talked about here. You know, the top-down is, um, 
you know, all vendors agreeing on a certain set of technologies that need to be standardized, where the bottom up is more like specification first, then reference implementations. Um, I think there's one kind of layer that hasn't been talked about, and that's what I like to call the de facto standard. And, and maybe this is where Eclipse falls into. Falls into. And, and the de facto standard is where um, the market dictates by just adopting the software. So it, by, it, it becomes a de facto standard just by critical mass of adoption. Um, in terms of extensibility, I won't speak to the Eclipse IDE, but it's interesting that something similar is happening in the next generation of cloud development tools. So for example, um, a de facto standard that have kind of have, have arisen is what's called language server protocol, LSP, and that's built, that was built originally by Microsoft for, for VS Code, right? But that uh, standard has now been built in, even though it's not an official standard, that um, capability has been built into you know, most modern cloud development tools now. So it, it allows, you know, developers when they switch tools to be able to have a familiar experience developing in their particular languages. Uh, that's what I call um, a de facto standard. Um, and I'd like to touch, you know, on, 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 on something that Lucas said about what's more that can be done. And, and, and yes, I, I think, uh, you know, European authorities need to do, <coughs> excuse me, do more, but um, there are efforts underway. You know, I think the open source initiative um, have, have defined several requirements that open standards need to comply with in order to allow good open source implementations. So there's good references there. Um, there already are initiatives by the EU. They published some papers and some guidelines. Um, yeah, like in, in the tool space, um, it certainly, I think, is a case of the, the, the software and the market moving faster than the standards. But as the cloud ecosystem matures, I, I think that gap is going to um, get narrower. Yep, uh, thanks. And uh, I saw that we have at least one question I saw in the chat uh, that uh, Matthew Wilhelm, sorry if I didn't pronounce correctly, is asking more on the technical than the legal side. If interoperability is possible without standards, in some circumstances, can standards be more of a hindrance than a help to open source? This is also partly uh, connected to, to what we already said, but is there uh, any anyone that wants to comment on this, let's say, first of all, well, uh, yeah, I mean, because of, yeah, I mean, what that, that was um, that, that uh, topic that uh, Brian was talking about the, um, mm. this, um, the, the presence or sometimes it's the dominant presence of, of de facto standards is what I was talking about before. I mean, this, this, um, this choice you have to do as a, in our case, as a company, uh, as an open source developer, um, to to adopt something that you believe in and you think it's good in the in the medium long term and, and has a transformative effect on, on, on the industry uh, that that's that's in a standard um, or if you in the short term uh, respond to the to the demands and the and the, the, the actual requests from your from your user base and your customers and, and in that sense, I mean, as, as a company, we, we don't have, in, 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 in our case, the obligation to implement a standard or adopt a standard. Uh, we have the flexibility to, in the some, short term, sometimes adopt um, a, a de facto standard. Um, in the medium term, long term, planning for um, also training and, and um, encouraging our user base to adopt um, more standardized um, solutions there. So in our case, we have that flexibility. But you know, in other, in other contexts, I understand Matthew's question in that, in that sense, for, for some other context, it might be a bit more problematic, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we also have a chat reply from uh, Tiziana Ferrari at EGI, uh, I see that she says that uh, the, the, the experience of the EGI Federation is that attempting to go in for standardization did not pay off because that was mentioned, uh, it slowed down innovation. So of course, another, even when the intent is the same, the, operate, the traveling speed is different and that's another possible point of strain between yeah. uh, open source. Yeah, speaking standard. of innovation, Brian also mentioned mm -hmm. the, I mean, uh, the standardization processes and, 
and initiatives, they have their own pace. Open source uh, development has, has their own quicker pace as well. But then we also have the major technological um, vendors, non-open non source vendors, and they have mm -hmm. an even faster pace. So we have three different actors there. And, mm -hmm. And, and that's that's a that's a, 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 a difficult thing to to combine, you know, those different like I, speeds in the market. You know, you know, I, I think they can open exist uh, or coexist rather. Like I think standards don't need to be all encompassing. Um, just as open source software doesn't, they just need to provide a platform to innovate on top of. Mm -hmm. And that's why enterprises participate in open source because they can, you know. Uh, bootstrap and ramp up products quickly and then innovate and provide their value level on top of that for their customers. So once the standardization process, the open source software process remains flexible to allow those innovations, I think they can exist. Yeah. I also was thinking that uh, it doesn't also have to be everything about interoperability. Open source certainly is not only there for interoperability, it's also there for freedom to change, for freedom to go your own way, to innovate. Yeah. So yeah. that's certainly standards also are maybe the, the, the say the standards are not there for interoperability seems a harder sell, but maybe also for standards is also about uh, consensus, is also about uh, thinking before doing. I mean, there are maybe also other points that it doesn't have to be all about interoperability. <laughs> If I may, uh, if I may add um, uh, a point, I agree with Brian, with his perspective, but, uh, and I would add also that, of course, standards uh, in terms of legal certainty uh, are, are, are precious, are essential, in my opinion. Every time we have to comply with the regulation, with mandatory uh, obligations. So in those cases, it's not only a matter of field, uh, of common field in order to enable further innovation. It is, it is a matter of legal certainty. So I fix legal certainty and then I, uh, I free, I, I give room to innovation just because of the legal certainty I, I established. So. This is important, in my opinion. Yes, sorry, I, now there is another another chat uh, comment uh, from uh, okay from Yuri. <laughs> so, uh, so you you're saying I don't know if you, if you if you want to speak it directly, Yuri. Otherwise, I'm reading it. Um, so you're saying that uh, the experience in this system is, in, is that uh, standards should, be, should not be a must, but are important when uh, you're building you know, significant services uh, uh, from open source component. And otherwise, uh, if you just uh, adopt the fact that, uh, that each component is a de facto standard per se, then you might have a certification problem because and that's, yes, this connects, I think, to your point on the legal certainty. So, even if uh, all the tests pass, then uh, it's not the same as having also the, the, the stated uh, legal uh, counterpart for, for, uh, for compliance, for, for compliance of the system. Any other uh, comments on this or we can move? Uh... Good. So uh, another, I would say another, uh, important topic uh, is uh, the trend towards, uh, I mean, trend, it's not even a trend anymore, it's already here, uh, towards edge computing, right? So from uh, this idea that uh, the cloud, uh, you don't know where it is and you're happy not to know where it is, and then it happens to be in some data center by some big company. Uh, now we are coming back to say, no, actually we want to be, to know where, where things are and place them close to where they matter. And uh, this also has implications from uh, technical, uh, but also from a trust boundary responsibility. So where is the computer physically also is a matter of jurisdiction. So this is very important. Uh, so again, uh, I would like to have, uh, to have a round of your, of your opinion about uh, what do you think from your perspective of uh, the, um, 
the impact, let's say, uh, and especially, I would say, double perspective, the impact from your own um, profession and your own, your own uh, let's say, angle of the, of, the, of the world, but also uh, what you think is the impact on the general European uh, scene on, in, uh, in cloud computing of this move towards edge computing uh, and also the, the various interpretations that are given no edge with Middle Earth that everyone is trying to, to cast it in their own, in their own image. So um, yeah, I would say so. Uh, importance of the edge computing. What are the consequences on on on, on your uh, activities and also in general on the European uh, uh, landscape and let's say future evolution. Also in light of the of the European policies that are also tackling that. So uh, now I would start with Arne then. Yes, I think this is a little bit back to what I mentioned at the beginning of the interest of the transcontinuum. Uh, the things that we we should look at how things fit together and certainly in, in most application domains we see a need to go from the edge uh, to the cloud and also add on some special resources like HPC or AI clusters, uh, GPUs and others and we need to look at uh, the overall uh, architecture and infrastructure where I actually believe that that cloud very well could be the glue uh, because uh, there are specialities on, say, the edge side or the HPC side, and there, there are focuses there. But, uh, but the cloud is uh, in the position to bring all of this together and, 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 and connect it. Uh, and obviously, through software with various uh, control mechanisms, it will be possible to, uh, to ensure also uh, location or, or handle that, maybe also with legal aspects because in, in many domains like health and others, it is uh, of importance where things are located and, and that needs to be controlled. Uh, so we need mechanisms for that. There might still be research on this, <coughs> say how to <coughs> ensure that you have the physical location you need, uh, but it can still be part of the overall infrastructure. So I think some advances here can still be done also from a research point of view, but, but this should certainly be possible. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really a great opportunity for, for the cloud community to be a binding factor here. It's kind of interesting that currently it's the HPC community that is driving this transcontinuum initiative, uh, but, but they are really on one of the edges here, like the other edge. So I think the cloud community could really play a bigger role here. Thanks, uh, then uh, Luca, I think, for the... Yes, I, I think that uh, the, the edge and all the, uh, the, the nuances of it, uh, so the far edge, uh, etc., uh, will add. It is an addition, not a subtraction. Uh, and I, I agree with that. Um, there will be a, 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 an ecosystem, a continuum, uh, implying uh, processing of data and uh, uh, and relevance for uh, uh, legal aspects uh, uh, that will include, uh, of course, also and still include the cloud, uh, even in um, in edge deployments. Uh, we studied a lot these aspects uh, uh, within some projects, uh, for instance, the next the next generation IoT. NGIOT project that is a Horizon 2020 project. Uh, the Italian Institute for Privacy is partner, <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, in terms of legals and also of, uh, ethics, uh, uh, the scenarios uh, are, are complicating more and more. But uh, what I want to highlight is that uh, in those cases. Uh, coming back to what I said before, uh, it will become uh, more and more uh, relevant to understand the roles, to understand the rules applicable to the specific scenarios. And let me make a, a, another example. Uh, uh, moving towards uh, uh, a next generation IoT, that is combining necessarily together the edge, the edge, the cloud, and many other uh, uh, technology and networks, uh, we should always take into account not only the primary uses of data, for instance, 
but we should always consider the need for secondary uses, both by uh, players that are uh, in the game, uh, operators, cloud providers, edge providers, technology providers, that could have a need or at least uh, a nice to have to, to, to use, to valorize data and metadata that are fruit of such processing. And so, talking about standards, it could be a good uh, point uh, to, to, uh, to reach a common standard, legal standard, clarifying legally and technically what processing of what data can be carried out uh, for secondary uses, for secondary purposes of the providers that are interplaying in uh, a specific scenario. This will become more and more relevant, for instance, in the public-private partnerships for smart cities, uh, using a multiple layer of technology uh, for specific deployments. And so I, I, I want to touch this example just because it, it is significant. Uh, if you want to enrich your, uh, your uh, uh, database uh, with anonymized data, or you want to use real world data and, uh, and make uh, and create uh, uh, synthetic data, uh, or pseudonymized, pseudonymized data and you want to, to valorize such data that you processed on behalf of other, uh, other uh, subjects, then you have to know whether you can or not, whether it is lawful or not, and how it could be considered uh, as lawful in terms of IP, in terms of data protection, and so on and so forth. And it comes back to uh, legal standardization. This is only an example, but just to be concrete and to identify a specific field of challenges, I see. Yeah, thanks. So, and of course, this is uh, complicated, as you said, by, by the move to edge computing because of the multiple locations and, uh, and uh, jurisdiction or trust domains that are involved. Yeah, uh, and then Brian, on this uh, move to edge computing and what is the consequence on your, from your point of view? Yeah, so from a developer tools perspective, um, it's definitely a complementary trend, you know, to the cloud to edge to IoT continuum. We, we could call it the tool continuum, <laughs> if you like. Um, so we're basically in the middle of a rapid shift uh, for cloud developer tools moving to the cloud. This moves um, the tool closer to actual applications and devices. Um, and it's not only a continuum at runtime, but it includes the full development cycle. Uh, it also allows for, um, you know, post-development tool interaction with devices and so on, such as, you know, collecting and analyzing data. Um, so, so definitely complementary there, but, but what does developer tool, tools at the edge mean? Um, it, 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 it's, it, it's, you know, more repeatable developer environments. Say you have engineers in the field, uh, you know, they don't all have to configure their environments. They just load up the same environment, uh, you know, and it's super fast. Um, um, there's, a, there's a huge effort underway also at Eclipse. We have a special interest group for embedded vendors. Um, so they're very, very interested in this. Um, you know, companies like ARM, ST, Microelectronics, Renesas, Ericsson, and, and so on. Um, they're, they're looking how to bring their tools into the cloud. So, so huge interest there. Um, you know, I think there's a recent trend towards using Kubernetes uh, on, on the edge. It's, it's not a one size fits all, I don't think. Um, I think it's, it's good for, for, for certain jobs, but, but not for everything. Um, so yeah, in, in, in general, definitely complementary, you know, developer tools and, and uh, IoT slash edge. Um, in, in terms of uh, repercussions for the EU and, and, and what the EU is doing, I, I think, uh, you know, Arne and Luca have, have definitely addressed some of that. I think they'd be closer to this than I am. Um, so I'll leave it up to others to comment on that. One thing I would say though, is that, you know, we do have a working group, a separate working group at Eclipse, uh, uh, IoT and Edge working group, uh, it's 10 years old now. 
Um, so our, our members there have a lot of experience working in this area and I'm sure some good insights could be gained by participating there. Thanks. And then Alberto has, uh, again, uh, the perspective, I mean, uh, what edge uh, means for, uh, for, for you, uh, partly already answered, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> but see what um, you can add. Yeah, well, it's um, well. I think my, my colleagues they they offer a very, very interesting approach on on, on this as well. Um, I mean, for for us, um, our transition is kind of a, um, a bit peculiar because we come from the private cloud world, so we are getting to this. I mean, we are building that cloud edge continuum. Uh, we come from the data center, so for us, it's like it's it's, it's a it's a data center cloud edge IoT continuum. And I'm sure in, in we'll wait for a couple of months there will be another term added in there. <laughs> but um, in, in in that sense, it's it it poses its own um, challenges uh, because we can we have this kind of legacy. We have to ensure this kind of legacy uh, compatibility and. and uh, with uh, with other kind of, uh, of infrastructure that's not that's not at the edge, uh, and then that terms interoperability is important for us as well. Obviously, um, the main challenge we have at the or we encounter at the edge is, as opposed to kind of more traditional hybrid uh, environment, is it's, there's a couple of things that it, one of one one of them is the how heterogeneous the um, the edge IoT uh, world is and and will be. And, and we we hope it will keep it the, this way because uh, if we, if we I mean if you look at the um, obviously the strategic priorities from the European Commission in terms of uh, bringing some balance to the cloud market uh, the expectations obviously is that the edge computing market or this disruption of this of the market through edge computing will bring some uh, some balance to to the situation now, which is, as you very well know, dominated by the uh, the hyperscalers. So, in that sense, this head let's see if I can pronounce it heterogeneous heterogeneity. <laughs> how to pronounce it? Um, this heterogeneous nature of the of the edge of the edge. Uh, I, I think it's a good thing, and then we have to deal with that, and we have to embrace that, and that's also a guarantee that the the market will be uh, more diverse and European companies in particular and providers will have more tools and chances to compete in the market and offer new, more innovative solutions to their customers. Um, then there's the challenge of the, of the scale. So that brings you to the next one, which is the scale of managing all this infrastructure. And for us, it's also a challenge and that's, that's how we are, we are uh, developing and, and defining these new, the new features in our, in our technology is to be able to manage all these uh, at a scale, so hundreds of providers, thousands of deployment, and and, and edge nodes being managed by by um, by our technology. So that's the expectation. Those are the expectations, and if you see the commission as well, the the expectations from the commission with this ten thousand edge nodes uh, being deployed in the continent by twenty thirty. We're talking about uh, potentially. It, those are the expectations. Um, I mean, we can assume if the uh, if the telco industry and and the uh, Cloud provider industry gets into this in full speed, at full speed, then we can expect more than more than that, hopefully. So we're talking about very large, very large deployments. Also, you, you integrate IoT devices in there, and you start you start provisioning resources at the IoT level. That's uh, it's uh, it's an amazing amount of, of resources to 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 manage. That brings us to another interesting point, which is the use of artificial intelligence in all this. And, and at some point we'll have to start this discussion, I mean, this debate about the implications of uh, what we're talking about, the, when we talk about this kind of a smart or, or AI um, powered orchestration at, at, at the scale of all these resources, uh, what are the implications of including this AI, artificial intelligence technology in there? Um, of course, things like the uh, Kubernetes that have been already mentioned. Um, in our personal, I mean, not personal, but particular perspective is the, the things like K3S, for instance, for instance, like uh, this kind of technology, this kind of lightweight uh, Kubernetes distributions could be could be an interesting tool there to to expand that de facto standard uh, to the edge as well. But again, that have to be analyzed on a, on a, on a per basis um, approach because. Um, yeah, and there are one of the good things about this this 
this wall analysis it's, uh, it's going to bring a lot of different uh, different scenarios and, and, and use cases so we have to be open to collaboration with others and we have to be open to very quickly change a lot of new technologies or develop together new technologies so that's not, those are our hopes with the new support from the commission through the horizon europe gaia x and the ipsi cis initiatives so yeah looking forward to what's yep. where show is going to be an amazing Thank, yeah time. thanks uh, alberto um if I'm not mistaken, we have more or less uh, 10 minutes uh, before we, we finish our allotted time in the session. So, Amrita, are there uh, questions uh, from the chat uh, or? There is one more right now, Tiziana wrote. Uh, yeah, okay. It's not a question. I'm interested in the panelists' view of the European efforts on the sovereign cloud stack in which Gaia X is playing a role. Okay. I... I'm happy to pick that up, to pick that up and uh, just uh, do that. I, I think the, the last round uh, on this, uh, this time, uh, as much as I enjoyed the conversation, I also asked to be a little bit briefer because we are a little bit uh, closing in time. So um, any takers on the Sovereign Cloud Stack and the role of GAIA-X on this? Uh, Yes, if I may, I, I, I can comment briefly. Uh, I'm skeptical just because uh, I think that there could be a number of issues to be considered uh, in order to uh, ensure sovereignty uh, actually and uh, not only formally. Uh, so we should understand whether, uh, first of all, whether we are able to have good technology uh, and uh, that is that is not uh, to, to 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 be to consider something uh, granted. I, I think at the European level, we should be uh, competitive at the global level in these uh, in these fields. Uh, and uh, sometimes it it seems that uh, competitors from abroad are still uh, stronger for for specific technology. More, uh, moreover, I think that uh, uh, we should be very, very uh, careful uh, in order to avoid, if we want national clouds, if we, if we want, if we really want a European uh, cloud, uh, we should be uh, very, very careful and uh, assess whether in the sub-chain of providers, there are or not uh, international uh, components, uh, international uh, and non-European uh, uh, sub-providers, because we could also uh, use a name and call this uh, national cloud, European cloud, uh, uh, sovereign cloud, but uh, if we still have and we will have sub-providers that are controlled by uh, non-European operators, then uh, I don't see the difference, uh, sincerely, uh, in terms of uh, legal sovereignty and, uh, and safeguards. So I have a kind of different understanding of this, uh, because my understanding of the sovereign cloud stack is not for the sovereignty of the cloud, but it's for the sovereignty of data that you manage in the cloud coming from the sovereignty of the European data infrastructure um, from the IDS part of Gaia-X. So the point here from my understanding is that we will ensure a stack in where you can handle and control sovereignty of the services and the data that are within the cloud, not the cloud itself. And it certainly, from my understanding, will be a federated cloud, including also international providers, not only European. So, so the, the cloud is not sovereign, but it will ensure sovereignty of the data and the services uh, when that is needed, which we, we see instances of. Yeah, the interpretation of, of what, what is the sovereign cloud stack indeed. Yeah, that, that's my interpretation as well. And, and I think we should probably stop seeing big cloud providers as the boogeyman. And, you know, you know, it's a different discussion of whether you're, you know, Europe can build, you know, 
uh, you know, a hyperscaler, whether we have the capabilities or the will in the private sector or the public sector to do that, that's a separate discussion. But, but yeah, I see data sovereignty and then the software stack as, as being. Yeah, so I think uh, the, the name is unfortunate. I would rather have called it Federated Cloud Stack or something like that. Uh, because I think the, the sovereignty is an implication mm -hmm. of the focus within the stack for, for data handling and not for the cloud itself, where I think indeed the idea is to be federated. Yeah, if I may, only, only to specify, my point is that if you have also uh, sub-providers or components that are handled by non-Europeans, um, non-European operators or players, uh, then it, it is likely that data will not be sovereign. Think about the Cloud Act. So we should find technical solutions, I don't know whether standards, in order to ensure that data are sovereign, even if there are uh, international players contributing to this federation. Yeah, and uh, that is in the, indeed uh, the, the reason why the IDSA, the, the International Data Spaces Architecture, is incorporated in, into GAIA-X, because that uh, uh, say offers a technology solution for, uh, for sovereign handling of data. So, uh, of course, it still has to be fully implemented, but that's the intention of this IDS architecture, that it should uh, be able to ensure that. Um, sorry to interrupt, Giovanni. We have just one last yeah. uh, question. Uh, can we? Do we have time? Just a couple of minutes from Yuri. He says, and I would be interested to know if the panel thinks we are doing enough to make important European open source software sustainable, or should the EC do more? Well, I, th I think I can answer both of those final questions together, if you give me a minute. So, first thing I would like to say is that the um, Gaia X project is one thing, the sovereign cloud stack is another thing. Um, we, as Op I mean, as Open Nebula, we are the European alternative to OpenStack. So I try to give you just the facts. So the Sovereign Cloud Stack is a project based on OpenStack and Kubernetes, but mainly on the, at the infrastructure level, it's OpenStack. That is a technology, an open source technology that is mainly developed and sustained by non-European vendors like Red Hat slash IBM. GaiaX is a, is, a, is a framework in which we're very much looking forward to, to contribute and participate as a European technology. So our, our approach and linking that to the second question is yes, we think the, um, there are more work to do in making European open source uh, technologies sustainable and, and, and uh, more influential at different uh, levels and specifically on the future of the European uh, Edge Cloud. And just adding there a link to a different approach to that taken by the sovereign cloud stack and the German government, um, which is something based on expanding that concept of sovereignty also to the technology we use to do that, uh, because we think it's important to use a combination of, if we can, and we have, and we have it, using a combination of European open source technologies to build that edge stack, and therefore to build GaiaX and the other strategic uh, projects for the, for the European Union. I hope I reply to both of those questions. <laughs> yes, uh, certainly did. Uh, someone else wants to comment on how much uh, Europe is doing and uh, whether it should do more or on the perspectives <coughs> that you that you see, for example, in, in digital Europe, I guess, for example, would be would be an interesting point. But if you have something very quick, otherwise I think we are really going towards the end yeah. of the of the panel. Please. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think Europe is doing a lot. I think we, we have to give Europe credit for a lot of the efforts, even though we tend to, we all tend to complain a lot. Um, let's, let's focus on the progress that has been made. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done. And just one other thing, like randomly that I'm encouraged by is, is more OSPOs springing up uh, in Europe, both in political institutions and in educational institutions, in, in, in not just in enterprise organizations, right? So another positive trend, I think. And, and that I suppose help them help everybody look holistically at open source and standards and how they work together. Very good, thanks a lot, Brian. <coughs> Sorry. 
Okay, I think we are now really at the end of, uh, of our time and uh, all that's left for me to do is to thanks uh, to thank everyone for attending and a special thank to you all uh, for panelists. I think it was very, very interesting for me to be able to see your, your uh, let's say, comprehensive set of opinions where we can certainly find uh, uh, some, let's say, common trends, the importance of edge, uh, the, the, the interesting but multifaceted relationship between open sources and bottom-up implementation and standards that sometimes they go they go top down but uh, also the nuanced and and uh, let's say multi multifaceted combination of uh, of your different perspectives uh, i think uh, uh, amrita we have, maybe we can post again the information for the project and remind the people uh, if they want to be contacted or get in touch with us, they can leave their uh, contact information in the form that you uh, indicated at the beginning. So maybe if you can post again uh, this, this yes, uh, last Yes, Giovanni, links. just, yes, then, I will yeah. do that, yes. yes. Sorry, go ahead, please okay. go ahead, yes. Um, thank you, Giovanni and Amrita for organizing this very nice Thank interesting session us. and uh, we'll certainly Thank be you, in touch. Thank you everybody. <laughs> yes. Thanks again bye everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.